Welcome to Lecture 7 for our class, English and Women's Studies 3073. We're going to be uh, touching on two short fiction works, two short stories, one by Dorothy Parker and the other by Zora Neale Hurston, both from basically the same era, the 1920s. And so we're looking here at modernism in fiction. Remember, our last lecture was modernism with poetry, and we got into imagism and those kinds of things. This one is going to be about um, modernist fiction. And we're just going to take a couple of examples. You know, most people, when they meet, read modernism, Modernist fiction, they read uh, works by male authors that you're probably quite familiar with, uh, Fitzgerald, Hemingway, folks like that. Um, and sometimes people don't get around to reading, I think, some of the really wonderful writers of the 1920s and 30s who uh, just happen to be female. So we're going to be talking in, the, in this uh, probably two-part video here lecture about the Roaring Twenties and social change. That's a very big, big topic, particularly as it relates to our class, being a women's studies class, a women writers class. And then the new voices of the Harlem Renaissance. What was the Harlem Renaissance? Where did it come from? Now, we're not a, we're not a class again. This is a, this is a buffet. This is not a class on the Harlem Renaissance. It's not the class on modernism. So we're just sampling, right? Just to give you a, some breadth there so you can have an appreciation for writers from different eras and, and uh, dip your toe in the water on a few of these things. So the first two things that we're going to be talking about, the, the two things we're going to be talking about this time are the Roaring Twenties and modernism and then the Harlem Renaissance. So um, we'll start off our, our, our sort of our subject here for case, case subject here for, uh, for um, the Roaring Twenties. Uh, fiction is Parker's Big Blonde, written in 1929, published in 1929, I should say. And, um, you know, having read through it, it's a, it's a fairly lengthy piece. It's not a very happy piece. You know, modernists weren't terribly happy people, I'll be honest with you. Um, and uh, it, it brings to light a lot of the things that were going on during the era. Okay, so I want to talk about the era first, and then we'll talk about the um, the uh, the the work itself. It's not a terribly difficult work to read, so I don't. I'm not going to go through and summarize everything. I'm just going to pull out a few examples to illustrate what I'm talking about. One of the things that a lot of us don't appreciate in you know 2019 or or 2020 or so, a hundred years later uh, from the 1920s, is just how radically different things were for women in the 1920s, and what a huge sort of tectonic earthquake shift it was in attitudes towards women, and in particular uh, towards young women and young single women. We all know that, that the 19th Amendment was ratified eventually by um, the states in 1920. It was passed by uh, the Congress in 1919. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was passed in July of 1919, so 100 years ago. And um, it, it, so it, it ushered in a brand new era of a new woman, a modern woman in the 1920s. By the way, this was this was the big social issue of the day. It really wasn't um, politics. It really wasn't other sorts of things. My economics, yes. Business, yes. But the big social issue of the day was women, um, and uh, with with the vote and with a sort of liberated spirit, a lot of people began talking um, very extensively about women's status and their position having changed. What will all this mean? The the modern woman was the topic of discussion. Who is she? Uh, what is womanhood going to be like? What is it going to be like to be a woman in the 20th century as, as time goes on? Some people were very threatened by it, as you can imagine. People thought this is going to lead to the disintegration of the family. It's going to lead to uh, uh, higher divorce rates. It's going to lead to loose women, women doing things that men... I, I'll give you an example. Um, prior to the 1920s, women just did not smoke. Uh, no one should smoke, but um, men smoked, men drank, um, uh, women would occasionally imbibe a little bit, but they didn't smoke. Smoking was considered kind of a dirty habit, kind of nasty, uh, stinky, um, but, uh, but they started smoking. They started going out together or on their own uh, to nightclubs, speakeasies, because there was prohibition going on, and all of this ushered in a brand new sort of vision of young women as, you know, and, and, and of course we use the term flapper. Um, the flappers were a bit of an extreme, but women began to cut their hair differently. They began to wear different outfits. They began to uh, be a little bit more independent spirited. They weren't quite occupationally oriented as much as we are today, but they did have, um, especially younger women, did have 
jobs, right? And they had their own money. And it wasn't expected that you had to go straight from your father's house to your husband's house. Um, there was a period of time there where a young woman could, could branch out and become who she wanted to be. And a lot of the colleges, for the upper classes particularly, a lot of the colleges for women were in their heyday at the time. And so um, it was an era after World War I where women, especially young women, felt an enormous amount of freedom. You had cinema icons like those down there in the middle there. Uh, on the right is, is uh, Clara Bow and uh, the It Girl, right? She was sort of everybody's ideal of, of what, you know, the all-American girl would be like. Except for the fact that towards the end of the decade, when silent movies were out, there was a huge scandal with Clara Bow. Clara had some substance abuse problems, some mental illness problems. There were lots and lots of rumors of probably exaggerated sexual promiscuity, stuff that's just really over-the-top stuff that you can't possibly believe. And then you had Louise Brooks, who was kind of the bad girl, the one with the bobbed hair there right in the middle. Beautiful uh, individuals. Um, Louise was the passionate vamp in all these movies, uh, the mysterious exotic woman. Uh, both of these were just beautiful women, highly successful film starlets, and were looked up to throughout the decade. Uh, if you look at the women in the middle of the picture, these were upper middle class uh, women, uh, and that's how they dressed. Notice the outfits. It's kind of interesting if you're into fashion history. Very, very low-waisted. They're now showing their ankles. Ooh, ooh la la. Um, and uh, notice how flat-chested. It did not emphasize the breasts at all. It was just low-waisted, kind of a boyish look. So a lot of people would look at sort of those dresses and they would look at these film stars with their shorter hair and they would say, women are trying to be like boys. Um, when in fact, oh, I guess there might have been a little bit of fun and, and frivolity in that, but it was mostly the attempt to be what they wanted to be and to strike out on their own and to not be as cognizant of social expectations. Um, over at the bottom there and up at the top, you've got these typical flappers. They didn't typically wear a lot of fringe. Um, they didn't do fringe back in the 20s. We kind of added all that. But what you, what you have is this vision of a new modern woman that's emerging, and it's all the rage. Everybody's talking about it. And one of those new modern woman, women was Dorothy Parker, a, a, a a, um, a member of the Algonquin Round Table, uh, and that's because they would meet at the uh, uh, Algonquin Hotel, and uh, they would uh, discuss all kinds of things, all these literary figures. There they are over in the bottom right. There's uh, Dorothy with the hat on. And um, she was considered to be one of the great writers, one of the great critics, one of the great conversationalists uh, of the era, and just a brilliant, highly uh, regarded uh, critic. Just Her one-liners are just amazing. You can look them up. I won't quote them all here to you, but it's it's worth a, a peek to see some of Dorothy Parker's really great one-liners. She knew how to really uh, get straight to the heart of a matter in a very meaningful and interesting way. So here here we have Dorothy Parker herself, kind of a modern woman, a little bit older than some of the others of the of the era. Um, but it's it's a decade where you have these 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 young women coming of age and asserting their own independence, and then what do we have here in Parker's Big Blonde? Uh, largely a train wreck, isn't it? Um, where we have uh, Hazel, who is a little bit aimless. She, too, is a working-class girl. Um, not a lot of money, but she's not out on the street poor as can be. Um, and she is experiencing life just kind of as it comes, a series of relationships. She decides to get married to a guy who clearly has a drinking problem. She didn't early on have that drinking problem, but begins to develop it as their marriage goes on. We don't have to chronicle everything about it, but Herbie is a, is a terrible husband. He's not marriage material at all. They have a miserable relationship, and of course, ultimately, it ends. You would think the story ends there. It doesn't. And I think that's one of the points of the story is, is to depict life for Hazel as being banal, as a series of meaningless experiences. She doesn't have any anchor in her life. She doesn't have a set of beliefs. She doesn't have a code of behavior. She doesn't have a purpose in her life. She doesn't have aspirations beyond just the moment. She doesn't, she lives in the moment. And I think one of the things that Parker is trying to illustrate with a character like this, this is me, is that without freedom without a sense of purpose is 
very dangerous thing because, you know, here we have a whole generation of young women like Hazel who now can do what they want. They can live the way they want. They don't have to live under the, under the roof of their fathers or husbands. Uh, but are they equipped to do so? Are they equipped to make these decisions? Are they educated? Are they, you know, have they considered the, 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 the risks and the, and the rewards and the dangers and the, and the, uh, of, of liberation and freedom? Um, she was, um, there's a line in the story where she says, this was marriage, this was peace. But the thing was that Herbie was not amused. So she finally finds some sense of stability, but it's stability that's based on a very, very flimsy foundation, and soon Herbie simply stops loving her. She was completely bewildered by what happened to their marriage. First they were lovers, and then it seemed without transition they were enemies. She never understood it, right? She just didn't see it become a you know, coming. Um, his drinking, of course, fuels this and she continues to drink he, he he doesn't like the fact that she doesn't want to drink as much and that she wants to stay home um and ultimately he just leaves he just takes off and says i'm done i'm blowing this place see ya have a nice life and that's the end of that and of course the lady across the hall mrs martin um and others who meet over there sort of for social reasons what you find is that the ladies across the hall have a way of making a living, and that is they have sugar daddies. And she quickly becomes part of that circle, of course, and has a series. Uh, you will be glad to know that the quiz is not, please list all of the men that Hazel has a, a relationship with, because I don't think Hazel could list them, right? Um, and this is not, and I don't think Parker is is criticizing Hazel for these liaisons. I don't think she's slut shaming her or whatever the phrase is today. I don't know. Um, I think she's just simply saying these are just a series of meaningless relationships that she just uses to get by um, because she doesn't know anything better. She, there's no other. She can't aim for anything higher because she can't conceive of something higher. Um, you know, and and ultimately. You know, she sleeps with somebody she's not married with, and then again and again and again, and she says, okay, so it's Ed, and then it's Charlie, and then it's Sydney, and then who's next? Oh, wait, there's Fred, then there's Billy, then there's all these guys, and, and so on and so forth, until the point comes where every day is just this boozy, kind of blurry, day after day, meaningless existence, and she begins to develop this sort of callous, not even callous, but more of a sort of an insensitive, insensitivity, insensible behavior towards men. They're just objects in a way. They're just, you know, entities that pay for things and that amuse you. Um, and when she's done, you say, well, she, you know, these men were using her. I think she was using them just as much, right? Um, but in other ways, it's not nearly as bitter as you're going to see, for example, in The Bluest Eye. Um, you're going to see some prostitutes in that one who really have very interesting and not very pleasant views of men. wouldn't describe it as being that harsh, but it's certainly uh, an attitude of, ah, they come and they go, right? Um, you know, this week it's Fred, next week it's Billy, whatever. You know, as long as the rent gets paid, I don't really care. As long as there's something to do and I don't have to die of boredom. Ultimately, she attempts suicide with um, the barbiturate uh, Veronal and does not succeed. Parker herself attempted suicide, if I recall correctly, three times um, and didn't succeed. And she famously, she, she said, you know, I wasn't a, f I was a failure in life and I was a failure in death too. Kind of dark humor there about, I couldn't even kill myself properly. That's how bad a failure I was. Um, she suffered from terrible, um, uh, depression and, and alcoholism. And, uh, sadly she ended up having been spending a, a very successful early career as a, one of the most recognized writers in America. She spent it as a clerk in a basement of a department store, um, uh, until she died, uh, really because of alcoholism, honestly, uh, leaving all of her money to, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and the NAACP because she was a very strong proponent of, uh, civil rights in the 1950s. Um, and, uh, but nobody really knew much about her after her heyday. It was one of those people you say, whatever happened to Dorothy Parker? Well, the answer is, um, you know, she, she went off and lived a, a rather anonymous existence, uh, until she died in 1967, uh, pretty much forgotten. 
Not her literary works forgotten, but as an individual, as a figure, as a public figure, she was forgotten. So why the title? Why Big Blonde? That's an interesting thing um, to ask. I'm not going to answer that question, but I do want you to kind of think about it. What's what's involved with that Big Blonde? How, how many ways could you think of that, right? Obviously, somebody who is big and buxom, right? Uh, but also somebody who is bigger than life or... or um, you know, a party girl kind of thing, um, and uh, it's it's not a it, the title isn't her name, is it? That's important. It's not her name. It's something about her, and that's that's uh, something to be pondered on. But anyway, consider this short story as kind of a um, a slice of life, a, a a portrait, if you will, of something that Parker was both living in a way. She was a little older than this generation that she's writing about, but also um, one that she saw as being elated and happy about freedom, but rather troubled, or she was at least troubled by some of them. Uh, next, we're going to talk about uh, the Harlem Renaissance and Zora Neale Hurston in our next video.